title of today's sermon is called Resurrecting Your Life. Resurrecting Your Life. One of the most revered, respected men in the Bible, next to Jesus, was a man named Paul. He was a disciple of Jesus Christ. And not just me, but many, many, in fact, most biblical scholars, teachers, argue that Paul, the disciple of Jesus, was arguably the greatest figure, the greatest person in the New Testament. But the amazing part of this story is not simply the fact that Paul is such a great man, but the amazing part is the fact that where he came from to achieve this greatness. Prior to his conversion, Paul wasn't always a Christian. Prior to his conversion into Christianity, Paul was actually a persecutor of Christians. He was the number one enemy among the Christians. He was personally responsible for imprisonment and death of hundreds, if not thousands, of Christians during his time. And yet he rose, he rose above from that dark past, and he was able to become one of the most revered, respected figure in all of Christianity. And my question to you today is this, how was Paul able to accomplish this greatness? Many people usually, when they have such a terrible checkered past, most people have difficult time rising above those scars, and they remain in mediocrity. But how was it that Paul was able to rise above such horrific past and achieve such greatness? We get a glimpse of that answer. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14, let us read that together. Philippians chapter, chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. In one voice, let's begin. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, is calling us. Amen. So how was Paul able to accomplish this in his life? There are, many, there are many of us in this room, like Paul, we want to achieve great things. We want to do great things. Is there anyone in this room that wants to live their lives in mediocrity, below average life? I think it is safe to say that most of us, if not all of us, we want to achieve great things, achieve greatness for God. But the reality is, many people, not just people here, but many people in this world failed to accomplish that. But how did Paul accomplish that, what most people in this world couldn't? The answer lies in this passage. And the simplicity of, that, of, that, of the answer will surprise you. First of all, Paul was able to achieve this greatness, great work, because he was honest and objective about who he was and where he was. Paul was able to rise above his past because he was honest about who he was and where he was with God. In verse 12 it says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved this. And this is, is from a man who planted, who planted Christianity in all of Europe. And this is from a man who's probably the most respected out of all the disciples of Jesus. And he says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. The problem that we have believe it or not, believe it or not, is that we often think too highly of ourselves. 
What I mean by that is, I don't think we stand here and we think that we're better than other people. But sometimes that we think too highly of our achievement. Sometimes we think we're better than where we really are. And I'm not, trying to, I'm not standing here trying to put you guys down. I'm not. But the reason why Paul says, is, Paul says what he says is because when he speaks, he is comparing his life to the greatness of God. And whenever we compare our lives to Jesus Christ, the inevitable answer is that we fall so short. But too often in our lives, we compare our lives to those that make us feel better. You know, when we play sports, you know, we don't compare ourselves to Michael Jordan. We don't. We compare ourselves to maybe Scott. I'm just joking. <laughs> you know, when we think about, when we compare ourselves to, you know, about our finance situation, sometimes we may consider, you know, compare ourselves to somebody richer. But in most cases, we like to make ourselves feel better and say, you know what? You know, I make more money than other people. I make more money than him. I have more education than them. Growing up in my life, I was always constantly surrounded by people who try to build themselves up by comparing themselves by saying, you know, I have more education than them. And I'm not trying to say that you should lower yourself. I'm not trying to say that you should think badly of yourself. But when we want to compare ourselves, if you want to have a goal, we need to compare ourselves to that of Jesus Christ. Paul might have done a lot in his life. But Paul knew that everything that he had done was because it was because of God. But more than that, he knew that a lot of his faults and weaknesses, and he was able to frankly admit that. Problem that many people have today is that we have trouble admitting those faults and weaknesses. We don't like criticism because we think we're better than we really are. We're not willing to listen because we believe we're doing fine. We're not really teachable because we believe we should be the one teaching instead. And that's what I mean by we need to, uh, we think too highly of ourselves. We need to always realize that, you know what, we, we can always learn. We need to always think to ourselves, you know what, we can always get better. Years ago, years ago, maybe about 15, 16 years ago, I went on a mission trip to Mexico. And uh, what we normally did was we went from village to village to village and we shared about Jesus Christ. We talked to people about God's love. And one time uh, we were paired up and you know, partnered with an, a group from another church. And so we took turns you know, preaching and sharing the word of God. And there was this one older gentleman. At that time I was in my you know, mid-20s. Mid and there was this gentleman, he was close to 50 years of age, and uh, he decided to preach. But before we, he went up in front of the crowd, I went up to him and I offered my prayer to him. I said, you know, may I pray for you before you go up? And when I did that, to my surprise, he looked at me and he goes, I'm fine. Don't pray for me, I'm fine right now. And I was, in, I was stunned because when I normally preach or do something in front of people, I, I plead and I ask and I demand people to pray for me. I invite people to lay their hands on me and, and, and me and pray. But when he said that, I was just utterly taken, taken back. And when that gentleman said that, an, another member from his church looked at me, shook his head and go, you know, shook his head in disbelief. And later on, he came up to me, and he, he told me, man, talk about spiritual warfare. And what he meant to say was, like, man, this man has issues. The bottom line is this. We cannot grow unless we can honestly assess where we are and who we are. And for this man, he did not know how arrogant he was. I mean, to reject prayer from a pastor, even though I was a young you know, pastor at the time, to reject prayer from a pastor, that's unheard of. Let alone, I mean, you should never reject prayer. I mean, oh, oh my goodness, that's like somebody offering you free money. It's always good. But he did not know and he did not understand his faults and his weakness. And for the longest time in his life, and he probably struggled in his growth 
in God. Years ago, when I was a young pastor, uh, there was a church deacon at my church, and I really respected him. I held him in highest regards because he was really a great man of God. And one day he gave me this advice that I will never forget. He told me this. He said, Pastor, when people criticize you, and this was one time where I was, you know, I had gotten into an argument, you know, with my wife, and I was kind of criticizing my wife and I was defending my position and he said to me pastor he said I just want you to know when people criticize you or make negative comments about you or have negative feelings about you whether you agree with it or not there is a reason why people think or say or feel those things about you. And a wise man thinks about that reason. What this man, Deacon, was trying to say is this. Too often, when people say something negative, or when people people are critical of us, our immediate reaction is that we want to defend our position. We want to deny their accusation. And what we in turn do is that we say, you know what, they're wrong and I'm right. And we spend half of our time that day trying to justify our position. And what this deacon is trying to say is this. Maybe you're right that your wife was at fault. Maybe you're right. It's someone else's. It's their mistake. But the reality is this. There is a reason why people say those things, whether it's true or not. There's a reason why people feel a certain way, whether it's true or not. And as a person, and as a Christian, and as a mature person, we need to think about that and examine our lives as to what made, what made us, what made me cause other people to feel that way about me. What made other people think, what did I do to make other people feel that way about me? And to be honest with you, that wisdom had a profound inf- impact on my life. From that moment on, whenever people said something about me, I always took time and said, you know what, I disagree with them, but... But there's a reason why that person is saying that about me. Because I did something to give that impression. Whenever some people have a negative comment, or say something that I totally disagree, that I know 100% that they are wrong, but still I examine myself and say, you know what, What must have I done to make that person think that about me? So basically, it always comes back to me. And I'm so grateful to this deacon because that type of thinking, that process, it made me a better person. It always made me assess myself. And sometimes I discover that, you know what? I was wrong. But you see, if I never took time to examine myself and assess myself, I would have never, I would have never made a decision to correct myself. That, you know, assessing yourself does not mean that we will automatically get better. But we will have a better chance of changing ourselves when we humbly admit who we are. We need to be honest about who we are. Second characteristics that enable Paul to overcome his past and become a great man was not only his ability to be honest about who he was, but also his ability to learn from his mistake. I mean, think about it. It doesn't matter if we admit all of our sins if we never correct correct ourselves. And there are many people like that. There are many people that accept who they are and say, you know what, you know, I'm lazy. And they use that as a crutch for the rest of their lives to justify their, you know, shortcomings and faults. People, you know, readily admit, you know what, I have a temper. But they're never willing to take that challenge and say, you know what, okay, I need to correct it and become better. And they forever use that as a crutch, as an excuse to justify their failed relationships. 
But Paul was able to achieve greatness and do great things despite his past because not only did he freely, honestly admit his weaknesses and faults, but he learned from them. Verse 13 says, Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. The key term here is forgetting the past. Believe it or not, as human beings, we have a very difficult time forgetting the past. We do. We tell ourselves that we do, but we don't. And for many of us, our past sometimes have a, has a strong hold, a grip on our present and our future. And unless we learn to forget our past, we, will never, we can never overcome our past failures and faults and weaknesses. But how do we forget our past? How do we for forget our past wrongdoings? You know, Paul, in his life, you know, when we look at Paul, and when we sometimes when we read something on paper, on, on, in a book, somehow the words just doesn't come out powerfully. For instance, you know, Bible tells us that Paul caused death of many people. Paul caused imprisonment of hundreds of people. And when we hear that, we're like, okay, that's bad. No, it's not bad. That's tragic. That's horrifying. That is unimaginable. If that were to happen to your wife, your daughter, your son, your best friend, but sometimes we don't realize that. What a horrific man Paul used to be. But Paul was able to overcome his past and find victory because he was able to forget Again, but how was he able to forget? Answer is this. You can only forget when you are forgiven. We can only forget when we are forgiven. You know, Bible gives this principle throughout. When somebody does something wrong, something bad to you, you know what? that person has to come to you and receive your forgiveness. I mean, those are the principle that is given in the Bible. We cannot overcome the past. And most people, we are filled with guilt. And we live in guilt. But Paul was able to overcome it because he was forgiven. How was he forgiven? He was forgiven by Jesus Christ, his blood. And because he experienced forgiveness in his life, he was able to forget the past and look toward the future. Years ago, I became a Christian at the age of 21. And when I became a Christian, I was so gung-ho. Gung-ho means I was so emotional and enthusiastic. I mean, I was just so emotionally high. When I realized the love of Christ, I literally had smiled from ear to ear. I already have a big mouth, but it was bigger back then. And I would go and tell everyone about Jesus Christ. I went to church almost every day. And whenever ch some people didn't come to church, I was like, how come you don't come to church? And I was so enthusiastic and gun ho And I remember a few months after that, you know, I decided, you know what, I need to stop just taking money from my mommy and daddy. I need to stop using mom and pop scholarship fund for my college. And I need to start earning a little bit of my own money. So during one summer, I was looking for a job. And lo and behold, praise God, I was able to land a summer internship for the city of Houston. And that wasn't easy. And that in, because, you know, back then, you know, there weren't too many jobs for college students, let, than, let alone an internship for the city of Houston. But somehow I was able to get that job, and I knew how I was able to get that job. It was because God helped me and God blessed me. And I know that. I believe that. So when I got that job, I was just enthusiastically, you know, I told everyone, you know what? With my first, pay, my first paycheck, I'm going to give it to God. I'm going to give my entire first paycheck. I'm going to give it to God. And when I said it, I meant it. Well, one month went by. 
and I got my paycheck. When I opened the envelope, <laughs> pulled out my paycheck, it was for $1,400. This was back in 1992. $1,400 is a lot of money even today for a college student, for adults. But $1,400 for a college student back then was a lot of money. And then as soon as I saw the check, just something went in my mind, something clicked. And I began to realize, I began to think about all the things that I could do with $1,400. And the more I looked at that check, the more it occurred to me that that was a lot of money. And the more time went by, I began to think about all the things that I could do with that money. With that money, I can go on my dream vacation to California. With that money, I imagine all the tacos I could buy at Taco Bell. The clothes that I could buy at Target, at TJ Maxx. The $40 shoes that I've always wanted to buy. And I realized with that money, I could buy all of those things and I could do all of those things that I wanted to do. And then this seed of doubt began to come into my heart. $1,400. And then I said to myself, you know, I don't really have to give my entire paycheck. Maybe half. So I decided, you know what, no, one, no one's going to ask or no one's going to check up on me. So I said, okay, I'm going to give half of my paycheck to God. And then another two days went by and I started thinking about the amount. Half of $1,400 was $700. And that, too, was a lot of money. And I began to think, $700. Round-trip airfare to Los Angeles is $200. Hotel, $60. I can go out to a nice restaurant for $8. And I began to think, and I'm like, wow, that's a lot of money. I could watch so many movies with that movie. And then I decided, well, normally... As a Christian, I give 10% of my income to God. I said, well, maybe if I just gave double that amount, that's still very good. So in the end, I ended up giving $300. You know, for about first week or two, you know, I didn't think much about it. But as time went along, I just, you know, I think some of you may understand that I just didn't feel good. Number one, mainly because I broke my word to God. And the second, second reason was because in my heart, I felt like I valued and treasured money more than God. And as months went by, you know, I didn't talk about it. And then after college, I went to seminary. And while I was at seminary, that, that past, that memory, it never left me. And every time I gave offering, I always remembered how I broke my word against God. And that guilt was always with me. But one day, and this was a good part, one day when I was preaching at another church, I confessed this to the congregation about my failure. And as I confessed that, this great relief came over me because I felt like as I was confessing this to other believers, I was also confessing it to God. And as I confessed to God, I knew that God wanted that and that he forgave me of that. And from the, that moment on, I made a decision that I'm going to learn from my mistake. Number one, that I'm not going to make hastily promises to God. I'm going to think hard. I'm going to calculate carefully before I make promises to God because I don't want to ever break my word to God. And number two, I told myself, I will do my best to never put money above God. You know, most of you guys know that know me well. I'm a very frugal person. I, spend, I don't spend money on myself. If you come to my house, 70% of the furnitures are from the dumpsters we picked up. 
Other 20%, you know, maybe it was donated. And other ones, I bought it through the internet, the cheapest kind. If you go to our shoe closet, you'll notice that most of my shoes are at least 10 years old. I wear the same thing. The shoes that I'm wearing are my dad's, which I received when he passed away six years ago. I'm a very frugal person. I don't spend a lot of money on myself. But one commitment that I made to God was that I will never put money above God. And forgive me for saying this, but for the past uh, seven, eight years, I've always given not just 10% that God teaches us to give, but I've given 20% of my income to God. And that is not something that's easy for me. But the reason why I'm able to do that and the reason why I do that today is because I learn from my mistake. I learned the mistake that I made in my youth. And I told myself, I'm not going to do that again. You know, there are many things that I do wrong. But in this one area, I told myself, I'm going to succeed and I'm going to do well. I've learned and I've tried to do my best to learn from my past mistakes. And in this church, there are many people that I respect. I really do. But, you know, he doesn't know that I'm going to talk about him, and he doesn't like it. But one of the persons that I've come to respect, along with many others, is uh, Mr. Kim Soo Young. Not because he's a handsome man, not because he's a wealthy man or he's an athletic man, but the reason why I respect him and I like him is because every time we meet together, he's so open about his faults and his weakness. He's always freely admitting, oh, I was such a terrible man. I was so bad to my wife. I had such a bad temper. And his wife sits next to him, and when he says that, she's like, yes, he was, yes, he was. You know? She readily agrees. But the reason why I respect him, and I'm blessed by him, because when you meet him now, and when you talk to him today, you, could, you don't see that. You don't see that. Because he always said, you know what, I used to be like that. And I realized that that's true. He says, you know, I, I still have a lot of weaknesses and fault, but he says, you know what, I used to be like that. And it's so hard for me to imagine for someone to be really that bad if, if what he said was true and if, if what his wife agreed was true. He's come such a long way. And he tells me that he's really learned from his mistake. See, that's how we are able to achieve greatness. That's how we can overcome our past. When we receive forgiveness, when we openly confess that forgiveness, and then receive that forgiveness from God, and then learn from that, and make a commitment to say, you know what, I'm going to learn from it, and I'm going to do my best not to make that mistake again. So I challenge you. It, it may be a little thing as, you know, sleeping past the alarm clock and missing church because you overslept. It may be a little thing as waiting to the last minute. You know, if you keep talking about it, you're never going to change and you're never going to achieve greatness. But greatness occurs when you learn and you change and you adjust. These are the traits that enables us to overcome the past and our weaknesses. And the last character that we see in the life of Paul that enabled him to succeed was this, that Paul, he always had a goal. In his life, Paul always had a goal. In verse 14, he says, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the harvest heavenly prize for which God through Jesus Christ is calling us. In Paul, Paul had a clear goal, clear objective for his life. You know, you probably have heard of this saying, that in life, if you aim at nothing, you will hit nothing. But if you aim at something, then chance of you hitting your target greatly increases. Too many of us, we live our lives without specific goals. What I mean by that is that we just basically live our lives going through the motion. And that's not necessarily always terrible, but that's not necessarily what is best. Oftentimes, we live our lives doing what we're told. Oftentimes, we do what we do thinking, okay, this is a good thing. 
And we do what we do in reality without any specific objectives or goal. For instance, when you came to church today, did you have a goal? Just simple thing like that. In your work, have you set a specific goal? In your school, do you have a goal? In your relationship, do you have a goal? Well, I tell you, I have a goal in every one of those areas. Because chances are, if you have a goal, subconsciously what happens is, when you set specific goal, from that moment on, suddenly, you know, without realizing, you do things, you say things to achieve that goal. Not necessarily you do that always, but chances are that will happen. In a study at Harvard, among Harvard graduates found that after 20 years, they did a survey among Harvard graduates that 3% of those that had written goals for their lives achieved greater financial success than those of the remaining 97% combined. 3% that had goals achieved great, greater success than the 97% combined. See, that's what goals do. You know, that's why whenever we begin worship, I always, you know, at the beginning of the worship, I encourage you and challenge you to pray and say, God, speak to me today. Bless me today. Because I want you to approach worship with a goal. Do you know that every Sunday, you know, used to be Saturday before I come, every time before worship service, I always pray with a goal. And my prayer is that God, please, today, that everyone that comes to all nations community fellowship, that they will hear your voice, that they will experience your presence, and they will leave having changed, even if it's the slightest bit, that they will have left this building a changed person. And when I pray, and when I think with that, live my life with that objective on Sunday, without me realizing my words, my action, my demeanor, my relationship with you, it's different. I, at least I believe that. So do you have a goal? Do you have a goal for your Christian life? Have you set a goal in certain areas? Like as a father, this is what I want to do. Do you have a goal for your wife? Do you have a goal for your children? Do you have a goal as a teacher? Do you have a goal as a worker in your company? Do you have a goal for the ministry that God has given you through ANF. I'm not saying that you will always achieve success, but what I am saying is that you will achieve greater success if you set a goal. Every year I set a goal for my life and for this ministry. Every year, even the beginning of this year, I prayed and I set a goal for ANF. I'm not going to share all of those goals with you, but trust, believe me when I say that I do. And sometimes I realize that without me, you know, without me realizing, I notice that certain decisions I make, after I make them, I realize I made that decision based upon the goal that I set at the beginning of the year. That's why it is important for us to have a goal, just like Paul the Apostle. Go all about your walk with God. Go all about all nations community fellowship. And go all about your family. Paul, the disciple of Christ, was a horrible man. Paul, the disciple of Christ, was an evil man. But yet, he was able to overcome his past, his failures, and his faults and achieve great things for God. In fact, he single-handedly planted a seed of Christianity in all of Europe. Half of the New Testaments are filled with his writings. And again, most people say that next to Jesus Christ, probably Paul had the greatest impact in Christianity. And again, Paul was able to do all of these things despite his hor horrible checkered past, because he was able to be honest about who he was and where he was. 
and because he had the wisdom and strength to learn from his mistakes. And he lived his life with a clear, clear goal and purpose. And I believe that with those principles, every one of us can achieve great things for God. And I believe that with that principle, ANCF, All Nations Community Fellowship, can do great things for God. Amen? Let us pray.